and it'd be like, you know, it'd be really easy for someone to just walk in here and start shooting. Why didn't they listen? Why didn't they do something? What else did we need to do? I think that's a really sad thing that nothing has happened. The people who had the role of keeping us safe are the ones that really threw us in harm's way. Islamophobia is real. It's a targeted campaign to influence people to dehumanize and irrationally fear Muslims. To fear what we were. To fear the choice of food we eat. To fear the way we pray. And to fear the way we practice our faith. For the last 10 years, New Zealand Muslims were under a microscope. They were stopped at airports and searched. Some had their phones tapped, their whereabouts monitored, their passports revoked. Spies showed up at their homes and mosques asking questions. All of these measures were in place to protect New Zealand from a terror attack at the hands of someone in the Muslim community. But that's not what happened. CNN Breaking News. Welcome back to our continuing coverage of the attacks in Christchurch, New Zealand. At least one gunman stormed the Masjid Al Nur Mosque. There has been a video posted, a live stream video of the attack. New Zealanders, they will be in utter shock. It is clear that this can now only be described as a terrorist attack. On the 15th of March, Brendan Tarrant walked into two mosques here in Christchurch, armed with assault rifles and shotguns. He opened fire on the worshippers, killing 50 Muslims. Now more than a week on, as the initial grief and shock and horror begins to make way for sadness, there's a question. Did New Zealand intelligence fail to protect the Muslim community from this? Ahmed Wali Khan and Abdul Aziz Wahab Zada are two survivors of the attack. They had just begun praying at the Linwood Mosque on Friday when they heard a shot, and then another and then another. And then the third one when it happened, there's someone, someone asked us like, help. And um, I, I just like straight away go like this, come a bit short as well, to look what is on the thing. And I seen there was a dead body in the driver wearing a white clothes. I was thinking on my first reaction was there might be some police or someone who was chasing me, anything like that. I ran, ran through the door straight away and seen the gunman shooting. Straight away come back and yell to everyone, get down to the ground as someone's shooting. Abdulaziz chased the gunman away from the mosque by himself and kept him from killing any more people. I screamed to the guy, I said, I'm here, come here, come here. I didn't want him to go inside the mosque because we had between 80 to 100 people was um, praying on that time. When he started uh, shooting at me, I tried to uh, duck between the cars and run to the back of the car park. My two boys was screaming and said, Daddy, Daddy, please come inside, please come inside. I told him, son, you go, go inside, I will be all right. He then ran after the shooter with nothing but an FPOS machine in his hand until he drove away in fear. Then I just come back inside the mosque, then I see it was chaos. You know, every lot of brothers got injured and um, some of our brothers was dead. But it's not the first time these two mosques in Christchurch were targeted. In 2016, a group of men yelling Hitler salutes delivered a box of pig heads to Al Nur Mosque while yelling, bring on the coal. The man responsible, Philip Neville Arps, was charged then with offensive behavior and fined $800. Last week, he appeared in court again for sharing the video of the Christchurch shooting. For two years, researcher Faisal Assad worked on a report to warn government about the growing concerns within the Muslim community. He met with people at Al Nur Mosque in 2017. We went there and we were welcomed and we made our prayer and it's so surreal to think that that's the same place where the massacre took, took place. But we, we talked to people in the community and, um, and people were saying like threats have been made against this mosque, attacks have been make, made against this mosque in the community. We have, you know, we speak to police, we, we've spoken to uh, law enforcement about, about these these threats and these attacks um, and I'm sure communities all over the country can relate to this. Signs 
signs have been coming our way for a long time. Um, <clears throat> and I just don't think many people took it very seriously. At the same time, stories about small white nationalist groups were beginning to appear in the media. Vaughan Tocker is preparing to fight. A what toward World War? It's claimed an Auckland University club called the European Students Association is actually a cover-up for a white supremacist group. The front is anti-immigration and calls the opening of borders white genocide. This is about the white race's survival. But it wasn't on the government's radar, nor on the radar of its domestic intelligence agency, the Security and Intelligence Service, or SIS. In the last 10 years, the agency's annual reports did not mention the far right or white nationalist activity as an area for concern. In a briefing document to the Minister of Intelligence in 2017, the primary focus of the agencies was, quote, dominated by the influence of the so-called Islamic State and those sympathetic with its cause. That same year, then Race Relations Commissioner Dame Susan DeVoy stood at the United Nations and asked for help. There is currently no central system for recording and collating details about crimes motivated by hatred and racism. Unless these events are captured and analysed, the day-to-day -day victimisation experienced by people because of their ethnicity is largely invisible. Did you get a sense over the last few years that there was an increase in these kinds of incidents? Most definitely. Even though we weren't collecting the data and it was all anecdotal and that was a problem, it was, um, it was very obvious that it was just a steady, steady, steady rise, you know, and there's no denying that after the election, after Trump was, you know, elected as president of the United States, um, people felt validated to do and say stuff that they normally wouldn't have. So if you have people coming out of mosques with hatred and with death, in their, in their eyes and, and on their minds, we're gonna have to do something, John. We can't just say we're not gonna look at it. With the far right re-emerging in global politics and a constant media spotlight on groups like Daesh, the public pressure on the Muslim community was mounting. In particular, the pressure on Muslim women who wore the headscarf. Oh, you know, we've had women that had their headscarves ripped off, had eggs thrown at them, uh, you know, people just yelling at you. Then it's the smaller things like not being served in a shop until everyone else is being served. Anjam Rahman is from the Islamic Women's Council of New Zealand. Her and others met with government agencies on several occasions to highlight their concerns regarding safety. I had someone trying to cut me off in traffic. I didn't let him, so he decided to follow me all the way to work to come and give me a lesson on how to drive. Um, That's terrifying. Yeah, well, I just whipped out my phone and started recording immediately and said to him, anything you say to me is, is being recorded, which changed his demeanour quite a bit. She says while New Zealand police have a good ethnic strategy and always respond to individual incidents, they kept no record of hate crimes and weren't as responsive to concerns that things were getting worse. What we weren't seeing was the preventative programmes and the real tackling of the underlying issues. Uh, which was all around uh, the media commentary, the social media commentary, general discrimination. It's a staggering statistic. Over the past two years, there has been a 2,000% total increase in net migration to New Zealand. Tim Vicargo man told a Pakistani taxi driver to go back to where you came from. You're an Islam guy. Richard Pross's call to ban young male Muslims from flying on Western Airlines. Two Muslim women wearing full headdress were refused rides on Auckland buses. So when the media reported you as calling the Muslim community in New Zealand as a serpent underbelly with multiple heads capable of striking at any time and in any direction, was that misrepresenting you? In 2014, the government passed controversial anti-terror legislation under urgency, allowing SIS to carry out 24-hour surveillance without a warrant. At the time, 80 people were on a government watch list, 40 for having Daesh sympathies and the rest needing further investigation. Brendan Tarrant, the shooter now standing trial for the murder of 50 Muslims, was never on that watch list. Muslim groups pleaded for months to meet with the Prime Minister, asking to be consulted on the laws that were going to target their community. But they were ignored. We know that the SIS were having these kinds of informal chats. Um, so they would approach individuals, they would approach individuals' households even, knock on your door and um, invite you out for um, a coffee or something. The representative uh, would uh, likely say something like, so 
We know that there was something on your Facebook page or on your WhatsApp group and at that point people would become aware like they were under scrutiny. It wasn't just a friendly chat to see how safe and comfortable they felt in their communities, it was about them. In other instances we know that people have been offered compensation to actually inform um, uh, on their communities, to become informants essentially. Um, and to supply the SIS with uh, reports, feedback, information, whatever, about the goings-on in the mosques and the communities. The Somali community was particularly shaken by the Christchurch attack, with several members of its community either shot or killed, including three-year-old Maid Ibrahim. But the same community has also long been the focus of surveillance. Guled Meyer knows these stories well. One of my brothers um, applied for a role online um, and it was a, a title was intelligence analyst and at the time he really did not know what he was you know getting into um, and he applied for it and straight away actually they got back to him and they said oh yeah we would really like to interview you so we'll come over to your place. My brother at the time was going through some challenges in terms of securing his citizenship. At the time they told him basically hey um, we're willing to give you sort out your citizenship offer uh, issues and at the same time give you form of employment. The catch is for you to go into the Somali community, just go to parks and stuff like that where people go play soccer, just you know everyday activities and report to us the conversations that are happening. So they're asking to become an informant? Essentially, In yes. exchange for a citizenship? Essentially, yes. So how does it feel then given the intense focus by you know both intelligence and the police on the Somali community now that your community has lost so many people in this attack. How does that feel? Um, I'm angry. I'm, 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 I'm really, really angry that it's the people who were meant to protect us, the people who had the role of keeping us safe, are the ones that really threw us in harm's way. The director of SIS, Rebecca Kitteridge, declined to be interviewed, but a few days after the Christchurch attack, she put out this statement. Over the last nine months, NZSIS has increased its effort to obtain a better picture of the threat posed to New Zealand by far-right extremist groups. The NZSIS has over recent years received a number of tips from the public concerning right-wing extremism and has taken each one seriously. Between 2017 and 2018, a series of roundtable discussions were set up to bring different government agencies together with the Muslim community. With the help of the Race Relations Commissioner, Faisal Assad and Anjam Rahman got a chance to speak directly to representatives from the police, customs, immigration and SIS to tell them Muslims felt unfairly targeted and not enough was being done to protect them. But were they listening? I think that they, they took it in, but it was one of those things that's just too difficult to deal with. They were afraid of political ramifications and we know that there's a certain section of society who's been very successful with this narrative about pandering to Muslims. The fears around that were enough for them to not act at the level that they should have acted. The complete, I think, inaction afterwards, you know, it was, let's do a feasibility study or let's write a report or let's understand uh, well, there wasn't actually, let's understand what the extent of the problem is, you know, there was none of that. Um, and then it just didn't really go anywhere. The head of state services who oversees both police and SIS, Peter Hughes, was present at several of those meetings. He also declined to be interviewed, and in a statement simply said his role was to ensure the right agencies were involved and to help progress the issues with agencies. Andrew Little, the minister overseeing SIS, was quick to dismiss the suggestion the agency had focused too much on Muslim extremism. As the minister, I sign every warrant that those agencies operate under. A proportion of those warrants relate to extremism, and they right wing extremists, and far right extremists. So let me finish. Terminology right. Let me finish. Uh, they relate to all forms of extremism. So you don't buy this argument that there was too much focus on. Uh, Islamic extrem extremism and not enough focus elsewhere. No, I don't. I, I say that from what I know. What does that mean to you? Do you believe that? I don't believe it at all for a second, 100%. Um, you know, I think they may have maybe just on the edges have had a look at it, but I don't think it's been at the same scale in which 
they've been monitoring us within the Muslim communities on a very wide scale, must I say. Um, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if I've been being monitored this whole time um, and being treated as though I was a threat to New Zealand society. So the playing fields aren't even the same. Let's make that clear. They're not. They're not. Um, and I don't buy that for one second. And it actually frustrates me because right now is the time to acknowledge that mistakes have been made. Things have not been addressed rightly and to talk about what we're going to be doing to fix it up. A few days after I spoke to Guled, the government announced it was launching a royal inquiry into the attack. While New Zealanders and Muslim communities around the world are both grieving and showing compassion for one another, they are also quite rightly asking questions on how this terror attack was able to happen here. In short, the inquiry will look at what could have or should have been done to prevent the attack. It will inquire into the individual and his activities before the terrorist attack, including, uh, of course, uh, a look at agencies. Uh, it will look at the actions of the SIS, the GCSB, police, customs, immigration, and any other relevant government departments or agencies. The last two weeks have been filled with vigils and marches across the country. People coming together to express grief, sadness, confusion, looking for a sense of reassurance and company, and trying to derive from tragedy and terror a newfound sense of unity. But what happens from here? As people return to their lives, the country to its sense of calm, the families and survivors to empty homes away from the media spotlight, and what becomes of the Muslim community? Heartbroken, fractured, and mourning. Could all of this have been prevented? Yeah, it's really hard because it's just this overwhelming sense of frustration, a sense of rage, of why didn't they listen? Why didn't they do something? What else did we need to do? Um, just this need to sit in front of those people and hear a response from them as to what they were thinking. It is actually shameful that some of these communities have struggled to actually get their voices heard around the table and when they have got there, then nothing has happened. I think that's the really sad thing, that nothing has happened. You know that joke that we all know, that kind of half ironic joke we used to say when we're praying or just at the masjid, and we'd be like, you know, It'd be really easy for someone to just walk in here and start shooting. And last week we saw just how easy it was. Um, and so to me it wasn't surprising um, that something like that happened. And you and I spoke about this before, that actually it didn't have to be like this, but a whole history went into the making of this. A history of dehumanizing our people, Preparing a whole community for slaughter, essentially. Um, from state negligence to um, fanning the flames of white supremacy and far-right ideologies and the normalization of racist and racial discourse in our countries. Um, it was building up to it. For sure.